Hello, this is Brian Rowe with LSNTAP. Thank you guys for coming out today. Um, this is a brand new training for us. It is with Transcend, um, who does some of the absolute best plain language work in the legal sector. Uh, very happy to have this as a new webinar for us. Uh, as with all of our webinars, this webinar is going to be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel along with the documents. Um, there is a sample test document that is under the handout section uh, that we're going to be using during the webinar. Uh, we've got a small group today, so if individuals want to talk, ask questions aloud, that type of thing, there's a little hand button there. If you raise that, I will unmute your mic so that you can directly ask questions. Additionally, there is a section called questions. Um, anything that you type in there, um, I will definitely be monitoring and get that over to our speaker. Um, we're going to get started here in just a minute. Um, to let people know, our training schedule is pretty much up to date through the end of the year. We've got a training coming up next on 614 that has just been added and yet to be publicized. It is over using GitHub and Bitbucket for sharing source code. We've got Introduction to Business Process Mapping in early July, and then we're going to do a Voice over IP Unified Communication System uh, webinar probably in late July. Along with that, we've actually got about six more webinars. We're doing almost 20 webinars this year. So I'd like to turn it over um, to Mariah at Transcend. Thank you so much for covering this new topic, and I'm looking forward to it myself. Thank you so much, Brian, and thank you for inviting me to give this seminar. Um, so today we're going to be talking about field testing, which really closes the loop on plain language. This is where you get to get some feedback from the actual users of your documents, so you get to see how they're working. So uh, as Brian said, please feel free to raise your hand and jump in at any time uh, if you have questions or comments. And if I understand correctly, this is a 40 five minute seminar, so I'll do my best to keep track of time and keep a few minutes open at the end for any questions that you may have. Okay. All right, just a little bit of background uh, about me. Um, I've been with Transcend for 25 years and um, <clears throat> been doing plain language and certified translation for roughly that period of time. Um, it's hard to believe that uh, so far we have done the only uh, comparative readability, readability study of plain language court forms in the United States, which is a little bit sad. I think it shows that we need to have more research and testing uh, going on on our forms to really evaluate what type of writing works best uh, for consumers. Um, we've been very fortunate in that we have done uh, a lot of writing for different uh, port systems uh, in the country. And I have been very lucky that to have worked with Professor Richard Weidick. Um, many of you may know he uh, was the author of Plain English for Lawyers and really was uh, the guru for um, plain English, uh, having started uh, this movement some 30 years ago, and also um, edited portions of Brian Garner's uh, Red Book, uh, the portion on visual accessibility. Okay, so today we're going to talk about field testing, and of course, you know, the question is why? Why should we bother doing this? And um, it's a question that uh, many people don't ask. Uh, they finish writing something, they put their pen down, and that's that. And uh, that's, uh, in, in my opinion, that's not enough. Um, we need to ask uh, this question because we have to find out whether or not what we've written is really reaching our audience. And so field testing will tell us if our audience really will read, number one, what it is that we've written. And uh, in many cases, uh, when we did that article that was published in Scribes, 
we found out that they won't even read it. <laughs> so um, that's important to know. And in other cases, we find out that they don't understand it. So that's very useful feedback to get from field testing. And when we get that information, that can really influence the way that we write future documents. And of course, this is um, another important guru in the field, Orwell and who's the one who tells us to write for our audience, write only for our audience. And when we field test and when we focus group test, it's really a chance to listen to our audience and to collect data. And um, the idea when we do this sort of field testing is to listen to what they say and listen as opposed to talk or instruct, or explain, tell, and listen to the words that they use, the words that they find easy, what they find difficult, um, the words that they prefer to say. And that can help us um, explain things in the future using words that are both legally sufficient and understandable for them. So today, there's, of course, many types of field testing. And today, we're going to be talking about one type of qualitative field testing. Um, there are other options. Um, we're going to be talking about focus groups. There's also observations and interviews and chats. But we like to use mostly focus groups because they're quick. They're relatively inexpensive. Um, for those of you that are part of court systems, you're very lucky because you may have access to jury pools. That makes them um, very inexpensive. And of course, it's very instructive for you. And the findings that you get are, uh, can be very rich. And how rich they are, I think, is based on how, uh, how competent you become at developing an instrument and how skilled you become at being able to hear what the focus group participants say and how you can translate that into what you're able to write in the future. OK. Um, if there's any questions so far, if you would raise your hand, and otherwise we'll just jump right in and continue. OK. As we field test, one of the things that we do at Transcend, and this is so helpful as we move forward, and we do this and we share this um, with uh, the people that we write with, with the different court systems that we work for is we uh, develop glossaries of the sort of the official uh, legal difficult perhaps terse term and what a legally sufficient more understandable term might be and so we develop these lovely glossaries over time of difficult legalese words and easier plain language words that can be understood. So it would just be so cool if all of us working in this, this field could share these wonderful glossaries or dictionaries or whatever you want to call them of easier ways of saying things and um, could pull them together. And uh, just to give you a, a quick example, um, even for the most wonderful writers, uh, one of the things that I see so often in so many court documents, uh, well, not court documents, um, court info sheets that are written with a lot of love and a lot of care is that um, to seek legal assistance 
And there, there you have, you know, why are we saying seek and why are we saying assistance? So just two unnecessarily difficult words that could easily be replaced with easier words. And, you know, if we could start tracking these words and just get in the habit of saying, you know, to find, to get, to have, and assistance would be help. And we can just get in the habit of saying easier words as we go along. And there's something about writing those words down and keeping a log of them that helps us to translate and get in the habit of using easier words. So, so, so where, do you, uh, where do you suggest finding um, these less uh, thesaurus or whatever you want to call them for lack of a better term? Oh, thank you for asking. So, uh, Brian, one of the projects that Law New York is, is doing this year on their uh, Read Clearly, Write Clearly, um, that we've been working with them on is they have um, uh, on their, I think it's on Write Clearly, is developing a glossary that takes uh, more difficult words and you can, you know, you put your cursor over the word and it translates it into, it offers you an option of an easier word. Uh, so that would be one way of doing it. And um, yeah, and I, I put the URL for that in the chat. It's writeclearly.org, and that redirects to the um, Google site um, where it has uh, all of those and some particular tools, including um, a tool that will look at your document and suggest easier versions. Thank you so much. Great resource developed with a TIG. Right, and then the read clearly will also, if you uh, access any part of your website, so for instance for the Judicial Council, if you wanted to look at how difficult the reading level of any portion of your website, and I'm, I'm not sure if this will do it for your form posted to your website, it will also give you your readability stats. Okay, nice. and uh, so as you, as you do this, as you complete the circle and get your feedback from the field test, you start to become guided by your readers' preferences and by their reading proficiency. So you start hearing again and again what your readers find difficult and what their level of understanding is, and then it's less of you at your computer, in your office, feeling like, well, this is quite good and I think this will do, um, as opposed to going out there and realizing, oh my goodness, this is not going to cut it because this is really not being understood. And then you realize you have to push yourself a little bit more to get it to a level where genuinely more people are going to understand it. And this is my favorite quote ever, and it's from Glenn Rodden of LSC, who is the most wonderful person in the world. And <laughs> <laughs> Brian, have you heard this quote before? Yes. <laughs> it's in our readability book, and it says, I used to know how to write, and then I went to law school. <laughs> and, no, and it, uh, it and is just quote, so accurate. The, we, we teach people to write in a whole different language that our clients never understand. So this, it's right on. It is, and, and unfortunately, we teach people to write uh, poorly at many levels of education. And uh, we're sort of always teaching people to get a little puffed up and uh, to make long sentences and long paragraphs and to not really get to the point. And I think unless you're a communications or a marketing uh, major, we don't really teach people to write for communication. And so when we write for plain language, um, we have to teach people to undo a lot of the things that they learned about writing. So let's carry on. Okay, if you want to uh, spend $15 that will be very, very well spent and to have some support, uh, please get this uh, little set of books. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, we spent a lot more money than this and we have lots of collections of uh, testing books, but this is really the best and it will give you some wonderful support and you can get a used set on Amazon for about $15. Okay, so in today's class, um, I think, you know, we only have 45 minutes, so 
Um, you won't learn the details of everything, but you will learn how to prepare an instrument. And of course, the instrument is the basic script that you take with you when you go to test your document. You're going to learn how to recruit participants, how to train the people that you do your test with, how to conduct your focus group test, and how to report your data. Okay. And um, <clears throat> the things that you need um, to uh, understand what we're going to talk about today are the sample test document that Brian explained uh, you can download and uh, it is a uh, language access uh, language uh, uh, rights notice and the um, instrument we is actually on this presentation so you'll have it here okay so think of this template of the instrument as a starting point. Um, I want you to have a template so you won't have to start from scratch. And um, the most important thing to understand is that each template will be different. And you have to um, make sure, uh, start with the fact that you want, you have to figure out what you most want your readers to understand about your document and then adapt it to the template and ask open questions so that you can see if your readers are understanding that. And the good thing about a particular organization or perhaps a larger group of people using this sort of template, um, which is really nice, is that we can all start talking about um, things in the same way. Did they understand the content? Um, uh, was, the, was the format appropriate? What were their likes? What were their dislikes? That sort of thing. It's like all using the same readability instrument. It just makes it easier for people. And also, um, the, one of the biggest problems that people have in using an instrument is they make it too long. And, uh, that's not good. And it will help you to see what an open question is. And that's really one of the hardest things in the beginning. Okay, so I'm going to just move forward on that. Uh, the questions, uh, there should be no more than 12. And um, you don't want people to get tired. You want to keep a good pace, keep moving forward, make sure that everybody's involved. Uh, we have a limited amount of time, and uh, it also helps you keep focused on the main questions. Uh, if you have a document, you have to know what your main points are. You don't want people, you're not focused on having people understand the tiny minutia of the document. Okay, so if we look at our document, which we will right now, we're going to try and figure out what is it that we really want most people to understand. So if we look at this, which is about language access rights, I would like to ask you to take a minute and tell me in your own words, what is it that we would want people to understand? And you could tell me in a chat or raise your hand and tell me what it is you think is the most important point that we want people to understand. And of course, this is already pretty um, plain language and pretty short, pretty easy to understand. It seems like you've got two focuses there. Uh, first, letting people know what their rights are, and then second, how to actually execute or use those. Okay. And uh, can I nudge you a little bit? What, yeah. what are their rights? The, the services must be made available um, in a way that they can understand and interact with. That it is not acceptable to deny service because of a difference in language. Okay. All right. Good enough. And um, 
So it, I, I would just say maybe we could take a poll. Do you think this is a pretty easy uh, piece of text to understand? Would most people understand what their rights are and what to do if they're not able to have access their rights? I actually think that this is a little, little bit on the complicated side. The you have language um, rights, people don't necessarily know what that means. I don't know. I, I think the how do you get help portion is great. Um, if you need an interpreter, these are the areas. It should be free. The emphasis on those I like a lot. Mm -hmm. OK. All right, so just, just, to, just to show you how hard sometimes easy things are, this is written at the, I think it's like the fifth grade level. Although it's not formatted yet, it's pretty chunked. It's got good use of bold and so on, but it, it's still quite challenging to understand. Okay, so we're going to take it out for testing, and uh, I'm going to move this over here. And all tests start like this, and I'm sort of, sort of going backwards, but this is really important. Before you, you start a test, um, you have to tell people some really basic things, and this to, to get people situated, that who you are, and um, when you go there, I think it's important to really dress down, no uh, fancy clothes or jewelry or anything like that, and that you're here today, and thank you so much, and um, you want their help um, because you have a document or a website or whatever it is, and you really um, want their opinion so that you can make it better um, because it has important information that will help other people, and you need their uh, input so that we can make it better to help more people. So anything that you say um, will help us to make it better for other people. So even if you really don't like it, and if you say something that's really negative, that's really great because it will help us to make it better. So does everyone feel comfortable about saying anything, even if it's really something critical? And you know, so you sort of just go on like that and then get everyone really comfortable. And that's, that's how you start. And um, I'm yeah, sorry. One, that. one quick comment. In, in yeah. doing field testing um, like this, I've noticed that just emphasizing to people that you are not testing them, that you are testing the document. If, if you don't understand something from the document, it's it's the document's fault, and we're here to improve the document. But make just make it clear that people are not cannot give you wrong answers here. There are only um, right answers coming from people that help yeah. us make the document better. Yeah, and and I think one way to say that is to not not even to bring it up. You know, mm. just just to talk about their opinions and how everything they say is really helpful and um, because we want it to be helpful for other people. So they're, you know, what they're doing is really an important service. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the other way that you can convey that, and this is over in the right-hand column, when we work with people in the right-hand column of the in instrument, we always explain why we're doing this and maybe what to say. And so sometimes when, um, when people say things, like when they say something that's completely wrong or weird or something, we just say, oh, okay, good, all right, and then you move on. <laughs> so um, no matter what people say, you always accept it, repeat it, acknowledge it, and, you know, just very warm, very professional, very accepting, and then you move on to the next thing. So we're never correcting, we're never admonishing, never, you know, any of those things. Okay, so for those of you maybe that have studied readability a little bit, this will sound familiar. The first thing that we say is, what is this, whatever, flyer, poster, website, about? And here we don't allow very much time. And the idea is that if you can't determine what something is about in a very limited amount of time, you're not going to read it. So we want to see if we can uh, get that person if there's going to be any reading interest immediately. And here, um, 
uh, along with the facilitator, we'll talk a little bit more. We're going to have, there's two other people in the room, the um, observer and the note taker. We're going to have people write exactly what, what the focus group participants say. And this allows us to keep track of the type of words that they use to talk about this subject matter. So we'll hear what they say. So if someone said, um, I don't know, uh, right to an interpreter, or language rights, or uh, right to talk in court, or whatever they say, we'll be writing those words down, we'll be repeating it, thank you, thank you, and moving on. So it goes very quickly, we acknowledge, we accept, and then um, we move on. So that's your reading interest part. Who is this for? This is your audience, and this is for re uh, reading persistence. And here, in terms of readability, um, there's the idea that if something is not for you, if you're not the natural audience, you're not, if you or your family or someone you care for is not the natural audience, you're not likely to read it. So we want them to say who it might be for. And um, then we write down what they say, we acknowledge it, and we move on. And here we start um, pushing a little bit deeper. Um, do you think this flyer would be helpful for people who don't speak English well? And then we talk about the overall level of reading interest, and we start exploring. And this is an, an example of an open question because um, we want to see what aspects of the flyer they actually were able to read. Um, uh, we, if you're looking at the sample test document, you can see we talked about lots of services and what they were supposed to do and where they were supposed to go and where it was they were going to, you know, get help. So this will tell us which parts of the document, in fact, they actually did read, they did see. So we'll write down those things and that will tell us more about what they read and what they what they understood. And of course, when they say no, that will also tell us some very interesting things. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, when we uh, tested um, this, the, the, one of the first versions of this, uh, one of the people said no. We said, well, why? And they said, well, if we were to ask for translations, um, it's our experience that we always get some like, uh, Castilian Spanish or Argentinian translations and they say wah wah and you know words that we don't use and we don't understand it's not really worth it because they don't use the same type of language that we do and we thought wow <laughs> that's a really interesting comment so um, you know you always learn things from from their comments so um, it's, it's always a, a deep a deepened understanding of what their experience is Okay, and here um, again, uh, this is um, we're learning to uh, ask a question that's open without giving them an answer. So uh, the opposite of an open question, of course, would be yes, no, and uh, here we're just putting them in a particular situation, and we're seeing what they say. So, of course, the little check boxes aren't something that we would say out loud. We would just check them if they happen to say um, one of those things. And it lets us know um, how they envision um, that they would use these particular services if they are understanding what it says and what it means to them. And um, so this would let us uh, gather information about what it means to this particular group. And this is uh, not a good question. <laughs> and I put this question in because this is um, this is a very typical question that sometimes we we get from our clients that it's this is a very specific question that they want to know 
And so, um, so here they, they would say, okay, is it clear to them, them meaning the focus group, that if they call or they text this number, um, that they're only reporting it, that they're not going to get an interpreter. And if it's not clear, how can we make it more clear? So in the first part of the question, it's yes, no. So clearly that's not an open question, right? And as you can see, and I think this is a little bit what you were saying, Brian, about law school kind of questions. It's a long, complicated question. And then the second part of the question makes it a little bit longer and more complicated. And um, so you have to think, okay, this is what we want to know. How do we turn this into an open question? And uh, any ideas on this one here? It's, it's hard to say without this in front of us. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't, don't have the document in front of us. Probably not fair. But let me show you what we did. So we said, what is this phone number for? And this was the phone number that they were supposed to call if they had a problem. So it's really a different way of thinking, right? You have to think, OK, how, what can I ask that will tell me what they understand? And it, it often is a very small, minimalist sort of thing. And and then, of course, it's often something that the focus group may not understand, especially if your document isn't well written. <laughs> they may not understand it. So then, too, um, the facilitator has to be very gracious and very accepting. So um, let's say you have a document that's not very well written and you're asking, well, what is this phone number for? And, you know, no one understands. And do you have to say, yeah, that is, you know, boy, that is really difficult to figure out. Let, let's, you know, does, you know, Florencia, do you have any um, comments on this? And or can, does anyone else want, want to add what you know, have any idea what this is about and say, that, that's really difficult to understand. Let's go on to the next one. And, um, or if someone says, well, this is how you make an appointment with an interpreter, it'll say exactly the opposite of what it's supposed to be. And you say, okay, does anyone else have an answer? And someone says, yeah, that's the number that you call for an interpreter. Okay, does anyone else agree with that or think something different? And if other people say they agree, then you can say, okay. And so, again, don't correct, don't anything, just write down what they say and move on. All right, and this is the best part. One of, and this is where we get to develop our glossaries. One of the things that uh, we always do is to ask them about uh, language. And we have yellow highlighters in the middle of the table. And we ask everybody to grab one and say, OK, let's look at the flyer again. And take your yellow highlighter and highlight any words that you think might be hard for some people. So not for you, but you know that might be hard for other people. Um, so even if it's a, a word that's easy for you, some people might find that think that it's difficult. And we always get a lovely list of words. And then we, then we talk about what are easier ways of saying those words. And then we go over them as a group and sometimes say, yeah, yeah. did anyone else think that that word might be hard? And then you know, other people will chime in. And is there an easier way of saying that? And it always produces a very rich, uh, conversation and a very interesting group of words. And that's what we keep in our glossaries. Okay, and this is, uh, we ask people what they like and dislike, and of course they don't see the instrument. This is something that the focus group team has. Okay, let's look at the flyer again. Tell me anything, absolutely anything. Remember, this is, we really want to know, we want to make this 
flyer the absolute best that it can be. So anything you like or dislike. And you know, so once they start saying, they really get into it. <laughs> and then of course, uh, you learn uh, with experience that some people are just like really good at this. And in fact, we have a couple of people, we do our best to invite them to every focus group because they just have a knack uh, for finding these little things that are so powerful. And um, if so, people tell you things. And then if they, you know, if they don't, for whatever reason, if they don't have a hard time getting started, we might say, well, how about the colors? Do you like the colors? And so if you get them started, um, then, then they, they're they fine. And um, going to the next one, the title, and if you've studied readability, we know the title is everything. Um, the first thing that people read is the title. A title is very important. Uh, on the Spanish version for language access, uh, language rights, um, in Spanish, this was derechos lingüísticos, which is a mouthful. And um, do you like the title? Do you think most people will understand it? No one liked the title. They thought some people would understand it, but that it was very uh, academic and sort of um, a little bit snobby, uh, for lack of a better word. And they thought, idioma uh, would be better, or interpreter would be better. They thought it had more to do with interpreting, actually, than linguistico. And this, so they had very interesting things uh, to say about the title. And uh, so that's very rich. You know, if they can help you to make a good title that's meaningful for them, that will get them to look at the document, which is the most important sort of key piece of text that will get someone to look at the document, then uh, that's a very important contribution. And then the last thing we asked them, as you can see, these are only 10 little things, but boy, we talked about a lot of important things. Um, we say, okay, let's, let's take a step back and just look at the whole thing again. And um, if you could change anything, just anything you wanted, what would you change to make this better? And they always have very interesting ideas. And you know, by this time, they know the document backwards and forwards, and they have wonderful things to say here. And not only wonderful things to say, but you as a writer, you really start appreciating the way they look at this information and what they see and what they don't see. So it's a wonderful step into the uh, seeing the way your information is read by your audience. So that's the instrument. And I think if we can go back, you can see that you know these 10 little questions are easily adapted to the way, uh, can be easily adapted to your documents. Um, there's the content questions have to be adapted to the content to make it work for you. Um, this, this one question five, the first question five, remember that that's not a proper question. That's an example of a question that's not good. So you'll have to take that one and make it an open question. But other than that, all of the questions um, you can adapt for anything that you're writing. OK, I want to keep track of time. All right, focus group size, uh, small or large. Uh, we tend to do, uh, unless it's a jury pool, uh, because of the cost, we tend to do small. And that's because we pay people. We think it's very important to pay people. We want them to take it seriously. We want it to be a job. We think it's part of valuing them and um, knowing that you know that it's important that you know they take it as a job. Um, so, but I think many of you are with court systems, and um, they're they will take it seriously, and they'll be happy not to have to be in the jury pool. So, 
uh, you may not have those issues. Who to recruit? So how, yeah. how much do you pay people on average? We, uh, we pay people between 30 and $50, depending on how many documents and how long uh, we're going to go. We pay them enough that it should be, we want them to feel that it's important, and they're going to be there. <laughs> we want them to show up, we want them to show up on time, and we want them to feel that it's important. And, and that's, that's typically for a two, two and a half hour total time, show up, intro, testing, and thank you? We, we don't... Uh, we don't go to two and a half hours unless it's extraordinary. We feel that after, we tell them it's going to take two hours. Okay. But, but we're really efficient. We set up before they get there. We give them their, you know, their name tags. We're ready. We want them to sit down and we go and we're like an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. And um, we, we, you know, we think people get tired and don't do well after an hour in 15 minutes, an hour and a half. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so I'm not sure I'm going to get through everything today, but let me get through this. The recruits should match uh, the profile of your consumers. In our readability article at the Transcend website at our library, uh, it tells us about California demographics. You should know about your own uh, state, county demographics uh, in terms of language, um, ethnicity, and so on. Um, so that's really important. Uh, if you shoot for eight people, you'll probably at least get five or six, which is good. You want people of different ages, different education backgrounds, different literacy uh, levels, uh, gender, income, and that will give you a nice mix. Um, it takes time uh, to build a database of participants. Now we can easily pull together people um, you know, in a day or two because we have enough people that we've worked with. But in the beginning, it takes some time. Um, we can easily, we tend to go to like waiting rooms at uh, health clinics, social services offices. If we need to have uh, a big pool of people, uh, jury pool uh, is, is a good place to go. And um, it, when you do go to the health clinic and social services, of course, you always have to let the people know uh, that you're going to go there. And we've, no one has ever told us no. So, um, and if someone says they won't go, you can ask them if they'll go at another time. And usually they're quite happy to do it. And I think people really like participating in these things. And they're, you know, it makes them feel valued and important in a way that they're usually not asked to be valued, so it's good. And collect their demographic information. Okay, Brian, do I have time to do a few more slides? Uh, yes, definitely. Okay, okay. Uh, facilitator, and for those of you who are uh, attorneys, I, I think the one thing is that you can't explain the law or tell them that, you know, what's right or wrong and you can't really help them and you just really have to lay back. So smile, be calm, anything they say you repeat it, okay great, so you think that part's not clear and this part seems too long. Uh, be flexible if someone arrives late, say just okay have a seat, we're on this part. Um, Call everybody by their name. Uh, you should have the name tags ready. Uh, if someone says something, just summarize what they say and do other people agree. Keep a good pace. Um, if someone gets off track, uh, you know, you have a difficult person, say, okay, we'll talk about that uh, after it's over. Uh, let's move on. And if you wrote the document and you can't handle someone saying something negative about it, don't, don't be the facilitator because it's not going to work. Okay, and let's see. For the note taker and the observer, you really need a couple, of, at least one other person. Make sure they read the document first and the instrument. You have to, have to be familiar with it. Stay in the background. Don't say a word but they have to sit close enough so that they can hear what everyone says. And they also have to help you write the focus group report. And uh, so they have to be able to take it all in and then cross-edit as you write the report. 
Um, at Transcend, one thing that we do that really helps a lot is that we pre-test every time we do a focus group test. And, you know, it seems silly, that instrument that I went over with you, you think, oh, it's so easy, the questions are so easy, just go in there and do it. But it's really not. You know, the moderator has to feel comfortable with the questions, and you have to kind of decide what your pace is. And, you know, if you're not really situated, it doesn't really go well. And so you just grab, you know, three people from the office, during lunch or whatever you want to do, and you practice it. And also the, um, the moderator and the, um, the observer, they should have read it and they should know if they have any questions, if something seems weird to them. And that by that time too, you know, do you have all your materials? Do you know where everyone's going to sit? Do you have your timing? Um, was there something wrong with the document? Are there typos in it? Sometimes when we're pre-testing, we think, oh, that question's weird. We better fix that. Or, um, you know, just something's wrong. And it really lets you fix something before you're, like, right in the middle of this focus group test and you realize that you've spent this money and you arranged this time and, you know, there's something wrong. So pre-testing is a really good idea. It doesn't take that much time and it, it really makes the focus group test go faster. And it gives you more data that you can look at. Uh, your space, uh, chairs, tables, uh, a mock-up of your document, um, highlighters, pens, um, the name tag. Uh, we have the tiniest little conference room in the world, but that's fine. Uh, we always have toys and extra chairs. Uh, very often people show up with their kids <laughs> and we say, we just give them a little toy and, you know, you just go with it and make sure there's a clock and uh, have everybody's pay ready so that, you know, at the end of the test you give them their check or their cash or whatever and uh, just send them out the door. And we have clipboards because there's usually not enough space, so sometimes the facilitator, note taker, and observer have to stand up and having a clipboard will make that easier. And uh, we have a, a an instrument, on our instrument, we always leave enough white space that we can write our notes very easily. And for quiet people, we can call them by, by name. And um, ask them to raise their hand. You know, who else agrees with that if they don't really talk? Uh, you can take quick polls. Um, so varying the type of questions that you ask also help. And we've talked about difficult people. Just say, okay, let's talk about that offline, and that usually works. And you know, being positive, but you know, shutting them down right away. Okay, and just really quickly, I want to show you uh, that how we sort of it, this document got better. It got better. It got even a little bit better, and at the end you can see the the side by side the one on the right it got um, the one on the left got even better you know it got to be that they told us that it was really an interpreter that you know what the heck does language rights mean anyway you know a language rights is something it means something to lawyers it doesn't really mean something to people who are not lawyers what it meant to um, people who are going to an office was that they could get an interpreter. And this, oh, well, but they could get translations too. It wasn't really the main point. You know, the main point was they could get an interpreter. And, you know, the, the little icons about where they could get those services were really helpful. And, and the names of uh, underneath them got more simple and the colors uh, you know, to point them out uh, helps people see that more clearly. And the text on the card got shorter and simpler. And, you know, so everything got simpler and more direct. And that was all as a result of input from the focus group. And that's it. Well, I'd, I would like to thank you so much. 
uh, for doing this training. This is highly relevant to what we're doing here at Northwest Justice Project. Um, we've got a TIG where we're doing um, some testing with videos that include focus groups, and this has a lot of practical advice in it. Um, thank you for taking your time uh, to cover this today. And just to remind people, um, our training schedule for LSMTAP is up. Uh, for the entire year, although we are always um, adding to it if individuals have um, other trainings or TIG grants or other things that they want to talk about. Um, the link is there in the um, chat. Our next training is on GitHub, ways to share your source code and Drupal projects. Um, there's actually even a Drupal um, group sharing a uh, session coming up on Thursday that's being done by Urban Insight. And then we've got our, what is very popular, our 50 Tech Tips in June, hosted by ProBonanet on June 22nd. So check out our training calendar. Um, and thank you, Maria, from Transcend. Uh, this has definitely been a very useful educational process here, and I hope to see more testing like this going on. You're very welcome. I guess one thing I'd like to say is that if anyone wants any uh, free feedback on their instrument, I'd be very happy to um, provide it. So just shoot me an email, and uh, I love doing things like this, so let that's, me know. That's a wonderful resource. We will we'll add that into the blog post and uh, to the post in the video also. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.